Welcome to this video guys. If you are a student in set one and you are targeting grade seven, eight and nine, then you need to watch the video. We will be going over 10 different exam questions that are targeting grade seven to nine. Various topics, all of which are problem solving. So stay tuned. All right, so this first question, uh, we have a cuboid and we are given some lengths and we've been asked to calculate the volume of this cuboid to three significant figures. Now, there are two ways that you can actually do this. Um, whenever you have a 3D diagram like this, there's a formula that you could use, which I will show you as well. Uh, just for understanding and clarity purposes, I will actually show you a method that goes through all the different parts calculating individual lengths that you may need. So I want to start off with that method and then I'm going to show you that um, easier method that you can employ. But it's important that you actually understand what's going on. This is the reason I'm going to show you this first method. So if we have a look at this question, we can fill in some of the details. We've been told that A to B is 7 centimeters, and A to B is 7 centimeters right there. And we're told that A to F is 5 centimeters, so we can write that right there. And we've also been given this FC as 15 centimeters, and FC is this diagonal length right there. Now, using this diagonal length, we can create another triangle, which we'll look at in a second. But how do you calculate the volume of a cuboid? Well, the volume of a cuboid is simply this length right there times by this height times by this length right there. And we don't have this length right there. So this is our unknown. We need to find that. And the way we can find that is to create that right angle triangle that I just showed you earlier, right there. Okay, so let's draw that triangle out. So let's do that right there. So there, so this will be our F, this will be our A, this is our C. So all I've done here is just drawn out this right angle triangle right there, okay? So we are told that F to C was 15 centimeters. So we can write that like that. We are told that FA right there is five centimeters. So we can write that right there. And this is our right angle. Now, why are we doing all this? You might be wondering. Well, see this triangle right there? My aim is to find this length right there. Once I have this length, I have this other triangle down on the floor here. And this is also a right angle triangle. So I will be finding this length right here. I know this length and I will have another right angle triangle that I will use to find this length right there. In fact, what I'll do is I'll draw this triangle on the floor right now. So you can actually see what I am doing. So this is our A to C. This is our A to B. And this is our B to C and we have a right angle right there. So all I've done here is I've just drawn this right there. So let's label that. So that's A, that's B, and that is C. So using this triangle, which is once again there to there to there, I will be finding this length right here, which will be the same as finding this length right there. They are the same side. And then I'll use that to find what this length right here is, which is the same as this length right here. So let's go ahead and do that. So using this triangle right there, how do I find this missing side X? I can use Pythagoras' theorem because I have two sides and I have a missing side which I need to find. Let's label our triangle. So this is C, it's always the longest side, the hypotenuse opposite the right angle. And we can label either of these A and B. So what is Pythagoras' theorem? a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. Let's go ahead and fill in our values. So a squared is five, so that's five squared plus b squared, which is our x squared, is equal to 15 squared, which is our c value. If we rearrange this, so x squared is our subject, we get 15 squared minus five squared. And then we square root that answer, 225 minus 25. And we have x is equal to the square root of 200 
And if we reach for our calculators, now we can round our answers here, but um, I advise you to keep as much of it as possible. So if we write down 14.14213 and avoid rounding right now, because the final answer will need to be rounded to 3SF. And the more we keep rounding now, then later on, some of our answer might go off the actual answer that we need. Right, so this 14.14213, we have just found is the length A to C. Now A to C was this length right here. Now we will go over to this triangle and write down what A to C is, and then we can find this length right there. So let's go ahead and write that in now. So that's 14.14213 dot dot dot. We can of course use the square root of 200 as a more accurate answer as well. So let's now apply Pythagoras' theorem to this triangle. Uh, we forgot to put this in now, so let's do that now. So A to B is seven centimeters, which is obviously given right there. Now, just like before, we're gonna label our triangle. So let's go ahead and do that. That's going to be C, and we can have A and B. It doesn't matter which one's which. So this time we are finding B to C, which is our B squared. So we could write it like this now. So B squared is equal to C squared minus A squared. All I've done is I've just written it in a form where I've already put um, our side that we need to find as the subject. Right, so if we continue that down here, um, B squared is unknown, so that's still going to be B squared equal to C squared. Now, Earlier on, I did say to you about the accuracy of an answer. Rather than using 14.14213, let's use the square root of 200 because it keeps our answer more accurate. So we're gonna write square root of 200 for our C. So we're gonna square that. And then we are gonna take away our A squared, which is seven centimeters right there. So seven squared. So the square root of 200 squared is simply 200, and from here we get 49. So we have now b squared is equal to 200 minus 49, which is 151. And now we have b is equal to the square root of 151. Again, we can keep our answer like this, or we can write down some decimal values. So 12.2882 dot dot dot. Right, so now we have calculated b to c. So we can write the square root of 151 centimeters that's our answer here of course you can write 12.2 or 12.3 rather um, if you wanted to as well now we are ready to find the volume of this cuboid so therefore the volume is going to be this length times by this length times by this length right there so that's five times seven times the square root of 151. And if you put that into your calculators, you would get 430.0872005, which you can round to three significant figures, which is 430 centimeter cubed. And that's your final answer. Now, at the beginning, I did say to you that there was a quicker way to do this, um, but it's important that you understood the process and this is the reason I showed you this particular method. And the quicker way was to simply square this length right there, square this length right there, square this length and then take them all away and square root the answer. And that would have looked like this. So you could have done this. The square root of 15 squared minus 5 squared minus 7 squared. And that gives you 151 straight away, which is this length. And then from there on, you could just go and apply the volume formula right there. Moving on to this next question, the diagram shows a solid cone. We are given the formula of a cone and the curved surface area of the cone. Uh, the diameter we are told of the base is 24x and the height of the cone is 16x. The curved surface area of the cone is 2160 pi centimeter squared. The volume of the cone is V pi centimeter cubed, where V is an integer, a whole number. Find the value of V. So where do we begin with a question like this? Well, we are given the volume of a cone and we are told that the volume of the cone is Vn. So let's start with that. So the first thing that we are going to do is calculate the volume of this cone using the formula that we have been given up above. So we are told that volume is equal to one third 
times pi times r squared times the height. So, do we know what the volume of the cone is? Yes, we do. We are told the volume is v pi. So, let's write that down here. So, that's v pi right there. And then we have a third times by pi. Pi is constant. And r. Now, r is the radius. We are given the diameter. The diameter, we are told, is 24x. So, therefore, the radius will be half of that. So, therefore, 12x. So, we can write down here 12x and we need to square that. And the height of the cone is given to us as 16x. So we can write down here 16x. So this is what we have so far. Let's go ahead and simplify. So what can I do here? Now you'll notice I have pi on both sides, so I can divide by pi. So if I divide both sides by pi, these pi's cancel. Next, I will just simplify all the x's and square that bracket. So what do I have if I do that? I have v on this side. Let's just scroll up a little bit here. I have a third here. Um, now, 12x squared. Now, that square will impact on the 12 and the x. So, 12 squared is 144. And x squared can be written like that. And times by our 16x. Now, I can simplify further. So, I have 1 third times by 144 times by 16. And that gives me 7 6, 8, and I've got x squared times by x, which is x cubed. So a simplified answer I have now is v is equal to 768 x cubed. What do I do now? Okay, so if you go back to the question, it mentioned the curved surface area of the cone. And it told us that the curved surface area is 2160 pi. So let's now work on that. So our second part is to look at the curved surface area. All right, and the formula is given to us. So we know that the curved surface area is 2160 pi. That's going to be equal to pi rl. So pi, the r is the radius, so that's 12x. And l, we don't have. L is our slanted side. So if you go back to the diagram, our slanted side is this right there. So Let's call that an L right now. How do we find that L? Because we need it right there. Okay, we currently don't have it. We can draw a right angle triangle on here because if you notice, if we draw a line down here, go across and along our L, we have this right angle triangle with this being the right angle. So if we draw that out now, so here, there and this is our l so if we look up here so that's our l uh, this is our radius so that's going to be 12x and the height is 16x so how do we find our l value now it's using pythagoras theorem because it's a right angle triangle so therefore a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared our c squared is our l squared and our a and b can be either that or that. It doesn't matter which way around. Um, so we'll have 16x squared plus 12x squared. And that gives us 256x squared plus 144x squared is equal to L squared. And if we add those up together, we get 400x squared is equal to L squared. And we now need to square root 400x squared. So therefore, L would be equal to 20x. So now we can go back here and write 20x for our L. So let's continue that down here. So we have 2160 pi is equal to pi times 12x times by 20x. Let's once again simplify this whole answer. So the pi's can cancel and we are left with 2160 on this side and 12x times by 20x. So 12 times 20, that gives us 240x squared. Now, to find what x squared is, we do 2160 divided by 240, and we have x squared as 9. So therefore, x will be equal to the square root of 9, which is plus or minus 3. Now, since x is going to be used in our lengths, 
Um, we don't want the negative value, so therefore x would be equal to just the positive 3. But we're still not done yet, because the question says to find the value of v. So all we now have to do is go back to this formula right there. Let's write that out again. So v is equal to 768 x cubed but now we have a value for x which is 3 so we don't need to write x cubed anymore we can just write 3 cubed and all we have to do now is put that into our calculator and we get 20736 so the value of v is 20736 and it's just a value of v remember the volume of the cone is v pi so this v is actually referencing to the letter v itself and that's the answer Okay, so now on to this next question. The first thing I need you to be aware of is this asterisk right there. This means that this is a question that will appear on a non-calculator paper and you cannot use a calculator on this question. And this is told to you right there as well. Okay, so everything that we are going to do, we are going to use no calculator whatsoever. All right, let's go into the question. It says the diagram shows a solid hemisphere, which is half of a sphere. The volume of the hemisphere is 250 over 3 pi. Work out the exact total surface area of the solid hemisphere, giving your answer as a multiple of pi. All right, so where do we begin? We've been given the formula um, up on the right here. So volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed. That should be a cubed. It should be written like this, 4 over 3 pi r cubed. Okay, so ignore that. And we're given the surface area of the sphere as well. Again, that should be written as 4 pi r squared. So ignore that too. All right. So let's begin by calculating the volume of our hemisphere. So first, we will do the volume of hemisphere. Now, we are given the volume of a sphere. But this is a volume of a hemisphere that we're looking for, which is half of this. So we will have to divide that formula by 2. So if we write down the actual formula of a sphere first, so 4 over 3 pi times by r cubed. Now to divide this by 2 is the same as multiplying by a half. So we can do that because that's much neater. All right, let's now fill in some of the information that we have. So we are given this, so 250 over 3, we are told is the volume of the hemisphere. We can replace that now. So that's going to be 250 over 3 pi is equal to a half. Now a half times by 4 over 3, we can simplify this by just doing 4 over 6, which simplifies further to becoming 2 over 3. So we can write 2 over 3 pi r cubed. Next, we will simplify this further by dividing both sides by pi and also to get rid of that denominator and that 3 by multiplying by 3. And that leaves us with 250 is equal to 2r cubed. Now we can divide by 2, so we have 125 is equal to r cubed. And then to find what r is, we're going to do the cube root of 125, which is 5. So we have our r value right now. What do we do next? We want to work out the exact total surface area. So just a reminder, let's underline that of the hemisphere, giving our answer as a multiple of pi. So now we can work with this formula right there. So the second thing that we're going to work on now is our surface area. So the formula for the surface area is 4 pi r squared. But once again, that's for a full sphere. Our one is a hemisphere. So we are going to divide this answer by 2. So we can do the divide by 2 like this. Now, they cancel, or they don't cancel, but they simplify. So you have 2 pi r squared. And this here is half of a sphere, the surface area of a sphere. But what happens when you cut a full sphere in half like this? You create another surface on the top right there. So we need to find this surface area as well. And this is a circle. So we would add to our formula right there a pi r squared, which is the area of a circle. So our full surface area will look like this. Surface area of our hemisphere is 2 pi r squared plus pi r squared. So we have the value of r. So therefore, surface area is 2 times by pi 
times by 5 squared plus pi times by 5 squared. And if we calculate all of this, we get 2 pi times 25 plus pi times 25. Now, let's collect all of this together. Now, just important here to distinguish that we've got a plus here and then the other two are multiplying. So this gives us 50 pi plus pi 25 pi, which is a total of 75 pi. And that is the surface area of our hemisphere. Okay, so next question, um, question four, Thelma spins a biased coin. So let's underline this word biased because that means that the coin is not fair. The probability that it will come down heads both times is 0 0.09. So let's write that down. So that's two heads. The probability of that happening is 0 0.09. Calculate the probability that it will come down tails both times. So let's quickly just put this on a probability tree diagram and see what that looks like. So we can have a head or a tail the first time round, and then we can have head and tail again on the second time round. Now, since we are given this information here, this means head and another head. So we know that this, the result of these two is 0 0.09. And we don't know the probability of one head. So we can write down x. And the second one will also be an x. So it's going to be x times by x is currently equal to 0 0.09, which is x squared is equal to 0 0.09, and therefore x will be the square root of 0 0.09. So the square root of 0 0.09 is 0 0.3. So the value of x, which is one head, is 0 0.3. And therefore the value of a tail will now be 0 0.7. 0 0.7. So we want the probability of two tails, so that would be 0 0.7 times by 0 0.7, which is 0 0.49. And that's your answer. All right, so the next question, a pendulum of length L has time period t seconds. t is directly proportional to the square root of L. The length of the pendulum is increased by 40%. Work out the percentage increase in the time period. Often you might need to read a question more than once to fully understand it. And as you read the second time, make sure you write down some notes. So a pendulum of length L has time period t seconds. So we'll just underline that. Then it tells us that t is directly proportional to the square root of L. So that means t is directly proportional to the square root of L. We can write that down right now. And then it says that the length of the pendulum is increased by 40%. What does that mean? That means that we can write down 1.4 L because that's a multiplier. 1.4 is a multiplier. So 1.4 times by L is increasing the length of the pendulum by 40%. Work out the percentage increase in the time period. Right, let's go back to this right there. What can I do with that bit of information? Well, I can replace the proportional sign with equals K and then the square root of L. Secondly, I can write down something that happens after the increase. So if we say that T1 is the time before the increase, which is simply the bog standard K root L, and therefore T2 is the time after the increase when L has increased, the length L has increased by 40%, so we could write K, the square root of 1.4 L. We now need to find the percentage increase. A percentage increase is simply the difference before and after divided by the original times by 100% of course. So what's the difference between the first time and the second time? Well that's simply the difference between those two. So let's put that in here. So therefore T2 take away T1. So T2 take away T1 divided by the original which is T1. So if we write that down now, so we have k root 1.4 L minus T1, which is k root L divided by the original, which is also T1. So k root L. Now let's work further with this right there. So if we break out the 1.4 L um, outside of that square root, we can have k times by the square root of 1.4 times by the square root of L minus 
k square root l over k root l. And now we have k times the square root of 1.4, which is 1.183 dot dot dot, there's more to it, times by the square root of l minus k root l over k root l. So all I've done is simply broken out of this right there. Now, what do we have? We have lots of root l's which we can cancel. So if we divide by root l, we can cancel this, this and this. And we can also divide by k, which also cancels. So therefore, this k cancels with this k and this k. So what does that leave us with? That leaves us with just 1.183. So what is our percentage increase? Well, we can simply times this by 100% and we will have 18.3% increase. And that's our final answer. All right. On to question six. Here is a right angle triangle. All the measurements are in centimeters. The area of the triangle is given as 2.5 centimeters squared. That should be centimeters squared there. Find the perimeter of the triangle. Given your answer to free SF, showing all your working. We have been given two lengths and the third one is missing. So obviously to find the perimeter, we need to add this to that, to that. We currently don't have that. We can use Pythagoras' theorem to find this, but the question does mention the area of a triangle, so that should also be popping into our heads as well. So if we start off with writing the area of a triangle, and what is the area of a triangle? It is base times height divided by two or times by a half. So we have been given the area of the triangle as 2.5, and we are given the base and the height as well as x times by x minus 2 and we can divide this by 2. Now let's work on this so we can get rid of that 2 on the denominator by multiplying across by 2 so we have 5 is equal to x bracket x minus 2 which we can also expand so we get x squared minus 2x. Now let's take the 5 over to the other side so we have x squared minus 2x minus 5 equals 0 and try to factorize this. Now this is not a non-calculated question so we can use a calculator but of course you will try to factorize this if you can using your double brackets your ac method whichever way but it appears that you can't factorize this so you'll have to use the quadratic formula so therefore a is equal to one b here is equal to minus two and c is equal to minus five so let's just give you a reminder of what the quadratic formula looks like so it's minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus four ac all over two a and we are going to substitute those values into our formula. So therefore, x would be equal to minus b, which is already minus 2, so therefore it would become a positive. So it would be a minus minus 2, plus or minus, square root of, again, minus 2 squared, minus 4, times by a, which is 1, times by c, which is minus 5. That's all over 2 times 1. Let's go ahead and simplify some of this. So like I said, 2 will become a positive, plus or minus, that will be 4, because minus 2, this is a mistake that students make a lot. Um, they write minus 4 sometimes. No, it's minus 2, that is squared. So it's minus 2 times by minus 2. That is positive, so it's a positive 4. Okay, so please don't make that mistake. Now, what do we have here? If you notice, we've got minus there and we've got minus there giving us an overall plus. This is something else that students also often make a mistake with. So it's a plus. So four times by one, which is still four, and then four times by five, which is 20. So you have 20 right there. And that's divided by two. So let's go ahead and further simplify this. So two plus or minus root 24 over two. Now, if we put this into our calculators, so if you reach for that, so on our calculators, you should get 3.45, which I've rounded to 3SF, or minus 1.45. So that's both being rounded to 3SF. We don't want the negative minus 1.45 because we have a side here called just x, and that means it cannot be a negative value. So therefore, the answer that we want for x is 3.45. So now, if we go back to our question, we can say that x is 3.45, and therefore 3.45 minus 2 is 1.45. Now we just have to find that third length here using Pythagoras. So if we label this C, let's call this A, let's call this B. So we have 
c squared is equal to a squared, which is 3.45 squared, plus b squared, which is 1.45 squared. If we square them now and add them together, we should get 14.005, and then we square root 14.005, and that leaves us with a value for c, which is 3.7423 dot 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 which we now can round to 3sf so let's say 3.74 so 3.74 is our answer for our side c and we just now need to go and find that perimeter so the perimeter let's do that up here very messy now is going to be 1.45 plus 3.45 plus 3.74 and that gives us a final answer of 8.64 centimeters. Very squashy, sorry about that. And that's our answer for the perimeter to three significant figures. Now, obviously this is very, very messy. So make sure that you go down here in an exam and write your answer clearly right there. Okay, so next question. Once again, it's a non-calculator question. So you cannot use a calculator here. There are 10 pens in a box. There are X red pens in the box. All the other pens are blue. Jack takes at random two pens from the box. Find an expression in terms of X for the probability that Jack takes one pen of each color. Give your answer in its simplest form. Right, let's go ahead and go through that question. But this time we are going to underline things. So X red pens, what does that mean? Probability of red is equal to x over the total number of pens which is 10 so x over 10. next all the other pens are blue what does that mean that the probability of blue which is the rest of the pens is going to be whatever is left over so 1 minus x over 10. so what does this mean all probabilities add up to 1. if there are only red pens and blue pens that means if you do x over 10 plus the probability of a blue pen you should get 1. So therefore, 1 minus the probability of a red pen, 1 minus x over 10, should give you the probability of a blue. So we can use this to find the probability of a blue pen. So if we do 10 over 10 for our 1, minus x over 10 for our red, what do we have? We have two fractions with the same denominators, and we can just work on the top. So 10 minus x over 10 is the probability of our blue pen. So now we have the red pen and the blue pen probabilities in some sort of expression in terms of x. So the question says, find an expression in terms of x for the probability that Jack takes one pen of each color. Let's draw a probability tree diagram for this, all right? So we have red and blue. We have red and blue again. We have red and blue. So the probability of red is x over 10, and the probability of a blue is 10 minus x over 10. Now, this is non-replacement probability because he takes at random two pens from the box. So therefore, he takes one, and then the overall number of pens in the box are going to go down. So his second red is going to be x minus the one he took over the total number now, which is not going to be 10, it's going to be 9. Okay? Now... For the blue, he hasn't touched it. So that will still be 10 minus x over 9. What about the red here in this case? Has he touched the red? No, he hasn't. He's gone through the blue route. So the number of reds will still be x. So this will be x over 9. Now, as for this blue, this is slightly more complicated because we've got this. And for this one, we know that it's out of 9, but we've had one blue taken out already. So that will look like this. It's going to be 10 minus x over 9, and we take 1 out. Now, if we simplify this, what does that simplify to? That is 10 minus x over 9 minus 9 over 9, and then we just do 10 minus 9, which is 1 minus x over 9. So this probability is 1 minus x over 9. Hopefully you understood that. Now, let's go back to the question. It says find an expression in terms of x for the probability that jack takes one pen of each color so each color that will be a red pen and then a blue pen or it will be a blue pen and then a red pen now 
In probability, or and and are add and times. So when I say or, that's add. So this will be added. And then red and blue, that means the probability of a red times by the probability of a blue. So let's go ahead and write the probability of this. So that's red and then blue. So that's x over 10 multiplied by 10 minus x over 9. So x over 10 multiplied by 10 minus x over 9. That's that first one. Or, that's add. So or, blue and red. So blue and red. So that's going to be 10 minus x over 10 times by x over 9. So that's 10 minus x over 10 multiplied by x over 9. Right, let's go ahead and simplify those two brackets. So the first one, what do we have? We have an x bracket 10 minus x over 90. And then the second one is going to be the same. So 10x minus 10 in a bracket over 90. So if we simplify the numerators now by expanding, we have 10x minus x squared over 90, and then 10x minus x squared over 90 again. The denominators are the same, they're both 90, so we can just add the numerators together. So we have 10x plus 10x, which is 20x, and then we have minus x squared plus minus, so that's going to be minus again, so that's going to be minus 2x squared all over 90. We can simplify this by dividing by 2, so we have 10x minus x squared over 45, and that's our final answer. All right, question number 8. Mark has a clay model. He will now make a clay statue that is mathematically similar to the clay model. Let's underline that. The model has a base area of 6 centimeters squared, and the statue will have a base area of 253.5 centimeters squared. Mark used two kilograms of clay to make the model. Clay is sold in 10 kilogram bags. Uh, Mark has to buy all the clay he needs to make the statue. How many bags of clay will Mark need to buy? All right, so let's begin. First of all, let's write down model and statue as ratios like this. Now, if we look at this right here, we are given the area. We are told that the model has a base area of 6, so let's put that under the model, and the statue has a base area of 253.5. This, what we have been given, is known as our area ratio. Now with these questions, it is very, very important to calculate your length ratio. So from an area, how do you go to length ratios? Well, you simply square root both answers. So you square root 6 and you square root 253.5 and that will give you your area ratio. However, Mark uses clay to make the model and the question is asking us how many bags of clay will Mark need to buy? What does it deal with? It deals with volume. So we need to find our volume ratio. So from our length ratio, we'll find the volume ratio. How? By cubing. So the square root of 6 cubed and the square root of 253.5 cubed. If we put that in our calculators, we get more simplified answers of 6 root 6 and 4036.146 dot dot dot. That continues. So what we have done here is listed down some of the ratios that we will need to use. More importantly, our volume ratio. So back to the question, let's now look at Mark and his two kilograms of clay that he uses to make the model. So second, we know that two kilograms of clay is used to make the model for a volume of six root six. Okay, so since we know that two kilograms of clay is used for the model to have a volume of six root six centimeter cubed, we need to know what one kilogram of clay gives us by dividing the 6 root 6 by 2. And this gives us 3 root 6. So a bag of 1 kilogram clay will suffice for a volume of 3 root 6 centimeter cubed. So now let's say he wants to build his statue. Now clay is sold in bags of 10. That's quite important. 
So how much volume does Mark need to make? He needs to make a volume of this amount or this amount. So third, the clay for statue would be, let's keep our answer accurate. So 253.5 cubed, which is the volume needed for the statue. And we divide that by three root six, which is the volume that one kilogram of clay gives you. And if we put this into our calculator, we get 549.25 kilograms. So we need 549.25 kilograms of clay. So fourthly, if clay is sold in 10 kilogram bags and we need 549.25 kilograms, to find out how many bags we need, we just do 549.25, divide that by 10, and we get 54.925. So therefore, we are going to need 55 bags of clay. So 55. Okay, question nine. The number of bees in a beehive at the start of the year N is P. The number of bees in the beehive at the start of the following year is given by this formula. At the start of 2015, there were 9,500 bees in the beehive. How many bees will there be at the start of 2018? Okay, so we can use our formula um, to do this. So if we write down the start of 2015, that's simply the first year or the year zero. So P would be 9,500. And then in the year 2016, it will be considered our P1, we will have 1.05, that's this right there, times by this bracket. Now this bracket, let's look at this, very, very simple formula actually. Um, sometimes students really get confused because they see all these letters. So if this is N, Pn, this is N plus 1. Let's make it really simple. Let's say this is free, P3. What's n plus 1 going to be? That's going to be 3 plus 1, so p4, right? So therefore, if we go back here, if this is 1, what we are looking for in here is p0, the one before that, right? And if we had to have, let's say, p4 here, what we are looking for here is going to be the one before that, p3, okay? So what is our p0? Well, p0 is 9,500. And take away 250 and just put that into your calculators and you get 9712.5. So next year you get 2017, which is your P2. So 1.05, let's do the formula again. And now we are looking for P1 and P1 we just calculated. So 9712.5 minus 250. And put that into your calculators, you get 9935.625. Finally, we are now at the start of 2018, which is our P3. So we want 1.05 bracket, our P2 now. So 9935.625 minus 250. And our answer is 10169.90625. So at the start of 2018, our answer will need to be rounded to 10,000. 169 or you could give 10,170 bees. Either of those answers is valid and will be accepted by the examiner. And on to the last question now, hopefully you're still here. If you are, well done to you, kudos to you and I hope you do really really well in your exams because of the effort that you're putting in. Okay, so let's have a look at this question. This is a non-calculator question once again, so everything that we do we cannot use a calculator. Let's do a quick reading of this question. It says, find an equation of the line that passes through C, right there, and is perpendicular to AB. So which line is it talking about? It passes through C and is perpendicular to AB. So where would this line be that we are looking for the equation for? It's a line that cuts in like that and goes through C. So it's perpendicular to AB right there. Let's draw that in. So this is the line that we have. It's an equation that we are looking for. So it's a straight line equation. Y equals mx plus c should come to mind. How do we calculate the gradient of this? We can calculate the gradient because we have been given these two points right there. What are these two points right there? We know that this is minus 2 for the x and 0 for the y. 
and this is zero for the x and four for the y. So if we use our formula for the gradient, it is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So y2 is our four, let's call it four, minus our zero divided by our x2, which is zero minus minus two. That gives us four over two, which is two. Now we are looking for the line which is perpendicular. So our gradient is going to be m2, which is going to be minus one over two. So we can go back here now and say y is equal to minus one over two x plus c. How do we now find our c? Well, we know that it goes through c right there, the point c. So we can substitute the coordinate of c, which is five minus one. So minus one for our y minus a half times five for our x plus c. And then this gives us minus one, and then that gives us minus five over two plus c. So we just need to rearrange this to make c our subject. So we can take minus five over two to the other side. So we have minus one plus five over two. Remember no calculator, so minus one needs to be converted to a fraction. Let's call it two over two, so minus two over two plus five over two. So minus two plus five, add in the numerators, we have three over two. So our c value is three over two. Our final answer is y is equal to minus one over two x plus three over two. And that's the equation of our line. Hopefully you enjoyed this lesson and you benefited from it. If there were any topics that you were thinking, you know what, I didn't understand it, I need more help on it, um, then you can go onto the channel and find a relevant video for it. So for example, this particular topic is equation of a straight line. Uh, go on there, I have two videos for equation of a straight line and parallel and perpendicular lines that you can go over. Until the next time guys, goodbye for now and I wish you all the best for your exams.